On this third Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of joy to remind us that just as the birth of Jesus gave his parents great joy, the presence of Jesus Christ in the world today gives joy to those who had none before. In Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, we read about the joy that was brought to the shepherds when Jesus came. The text says, But the angel said to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Like those shepherds, we have joy because in Christ, God's favor rests on us. His love and his salvation are delivered to us in the person of Jesus, which is why the scriptures say, Rejoice in the Lord always. At this time, I'd like to invite Leila Crotchet, one of our new members in 2016, to come and light for us the joy candle, assisted by her great-grandmother, Pat Gibson. the assistance of Pastor Brent, and we'll see. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, giver of great joy, as we wait for the day when we celebrate your birth, and also for the day when you will come again. Fill our hearts with the joy that only you can bring. Keep us mindful of your presence with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your joy with others. We ask all this in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem, even our Savior, the Christ. Amen. Well, they say Jesus is the reason for the season. And we're going to look this morning very closely at the reason Jesus came in a message titled, What He Came to Do. Walter Neff looked across the hall at the clock on the wall. It was 8 p.m. and he was just three hours away from being executed. They moved him to the holding cell the day before, and he'd been pacing like a caged tiger ever since. He didn't want to sleep to lose any of the last precious hours that remained to him. He still held out a glimmer of hope that the, that the governor would come through with a stay like he had the last two times. But Walter's lawyers had warned him that after 11 years of appeals, it looked like his luck had finally run out. The Beatles' greatest hit CD was playing on a boombox on a, on a table across from his cell. He'd requested it and the guards had complied. He listened pensively to the old songs as they spilled out, a reflection of some of the feelings that were flowing through him. Yesterday, 
All my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. So many mistakes from his past had caught up with him the night of the murder. Drugs, theft, betrayals. He'd ridden the wave high for a while, gotten away with so much, but then in one critical moment when he had to choose, he pulled the trigger. And now it was time for him to pay. Help! I need somebody! Help! Not just anybody! Help! You know I need someone! Help! Used to be when he was a kid that his dad would show up and, and pull him out of some of the scrapes he got in. Occasionally a teacher came along and tried to point him toward the straight and narrow. Even the local rabbi got a hold of him one time and reminded him that people who break the Ten Commandments on a regular basis do not make God happy. God, he didn't know what to believe about him. He had no idea when he took his final breath where he'd be. But he figured he would be in hell where murderers ought to go. And probably that's where he belonged. Certainly his victim's family thought he did. He looked over at the food growing cold on his tray, his last supper, just what he'd asked for, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. But the ice cream was melted. He'd miss ice cream and watching the Cardinals play on TV. He'd miss his video games and his smokes they told him that lethal injection wasn't so bad, just like falling asleep. But what did they know? Had any of them tried it? Just then he heard the loud sound of a door opening and closing in the distance, and there were footsteps coming down the hall, and they echoed on the concrete walls. No, not yet. It wasn't time yet. He had three more hours. But there he was, rounding the corner, the warden, with a paper in his hand, was it a stay of execution or a death warrant about to be carried out? He couldn't tell by the expression on the warden's face or by looking at the young man who stood next to the warden. And then the warden spoke. Walter Neff, you were found guilty of murder in the first degree by a jury of your peers and sentenced to death by lethal injection. That sentence is to be carried out tonight at 11 p.m. Walter took a step back. He felt a panic rising in his chest. And then the warden continued. But something has happened. It's never happened before, and I don't imagine it'll ever happen again. Even now, I find it hard to believe. Walter Neff, this man standing next to me, has asked if he can take your place on the gurney tonight. He's volunteered to give up his life in exchange for yours. He made this offer to your lawyers a few hours ago, and they took it to the powers that be, and it has been approved. This paper here, it's the authorization for you to be released. Walter was speechless. He, he couldn't move, couldn't breathe for 11 years. He'd been psyching himself up to face death, and now suddenly he was being given his life back. And he looked at this young man who stood quietly resolved, his features plain, his eyes clear. And then Walter asked him, Why? I, I don't know you. Why would you do this for me? And the man replied, I'm doing it so that you'll believe something is true that you've never believed before. I'm doing it so that you will know without doubt that God loves you, Walter. And he wants to redeem you from the dark cell you've been held in for so long. 
And if that takes somebody else giving up their life to save yours, he'll do it. He and I will do it together. And when we do, then you have a chance to start over, Walter. Start fresh to be somebody new, the somebody God intended you to be from the beginning. But the bottom line is, someone has to be punished to die for your crimes tonight. And God wants it to be me. Walter felt a strange sense of joy and guilt and grief and relief all stirring within him as he stepped out of the holding cell and the stranger stepped in. Walter said to him, they say it's just like falling to sleep. It's an easy way to go. The stranger sat down and bowed his head as if he were praying. And the warden said, let's go, Walter. We've got a change of clothes for you and a car waiting right outside the door. And as they turned to leave, the Beatles kept on singing. And their words of their song spoke to Walter and the stranger in special ways. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be, 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 whisper words of wisdom, let it be. If Walter Neff's story sounds familiar to you, there's a reason. It's because in a very unique way, it is also your story and mine. You see, there was a time in the days before we knew Jesus when we were condemned to death by the crimes that we committed by the sin nature that we'd inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. We stood in opposition to the God who is just and who cannot tolerate transgressions. We were just as lost as Walter Neff, just as doomed to a life separated from God for all eternity, whether we knew it or not. In this regard, we were much like our spiritual ancestors, those who walked this road before us centuries ago. But for them... God had given them a picture that his justice was also balanced by his mercy. That there were times when what we could not do for ourselves, he would step in and do for us. For the folks who inhabit the pages of the Old Testament, there's a story of Abraham that speaks to this very thing. Abraham and Sarah, an old childless couple to whom God promised a baby and God delivered. And the boy... They named Isaac, and he was their pride and joy. Yet one day, God called Abraham to do what no father would ever dream of doing. God wanted Abraham to take Isaac to the top of a mountain and make of him a burnt offering as a sacrifice for sin. That's what they did back then, you know. They, they made sacrifices as an atonement to God for their wrongdoing. But usually it was an animal whose blood was shed. Now God was requiring Isaac, a human being. Would Abraham be able to obey God's command? He was certainly intending to do so as much as he loved his boy. He and Isaac had built an altar, arranged the wood on top of it, and then suddenly Abraham took the lad, tied him up, and then raised his knife to kill him. Isaac was in a Walter Neff position. Death was bearing down on him. And if something didn't happen quick, if someone didn't intervene, Isaac would be history. But then suddenly, 
a stay of execution. God stopped Abraham before it was too late. He told him not to harm the boy. And as he did, suddenly, in a thicket over yonder, a ram appeared. Its horns caught in the branches. And Abraham went and sacrificed that ram in the place of his son. And he called that spot, the Lord will provide. Because God had provided a substitute to be offered as a sacrifice for sin. A beautiful foreshadowing of things that were to come. Because in the New Testament, what God was willing to do for Abraham, he was not willing to do for himself. When the sins of the people continue to separate them from God, and their burnt offerings have become mere rituals rather than heartfelt repentance, God decided to do what no father would ever dream of doing. To sacrifice his only son Jesus. To have him die on a cross as a once and for all atonement for the sins of, of, of you and, and of me as well. To secure for us the pardon that we needed to escape our own crosses. And there would be no reprieve for Jesus. No last minute substitute. Jesus would bear on his shoulders the sins of the world. Why? The scriptures say it plainly in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Which means we were perishing, right? But have everlasting life. Now, that's almost too good to be true, isn't it? Like Walter Neff experienced, Jesus stepped in to take his place on the gurney so he could be set free. And Jesus did the very same thing for us. But how does it work? That's what we find our brother Paul talking about in the book of Romans this morning. Let's look at what he says in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse number 6. This is what Paul says. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? The folks who were yeah, us before we knew him. The ungodly, folks who are far from God, who are insensitive to God, who may be totally unaware of God and unaware of their sins are offending him, that there's justice in the world and a balance in the world. Very rarely, Paul says, will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, you know, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still in the act of lying and cheating and committing adultery and lusting in our hearts and committing murder and all of those things, while we were actively engaged in the things of darkness, Christ died for us. And we weren't even aware he was doing it. Now Paul says, since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Because it was wrath that was heading our way, right? When you're without Christ, God's wrath is heading your direction. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him to the death of his son, how much more... Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. The life we have once we come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Why does Jesus do it? Because he loves us too much to leave us where we were and he knows that without him that's exactly where we'd stay lost doomed beyond redemption but that's not where we have to be 
If we put our trust in Christ, if we choose to believe in him and what he's done for us, then we shall surely be spared from God's wrath, as Paul says, reconciled to God through Christ. That's what the elements on this table represent this morning. This meal is about an execution, about a broken body and spilled blood, about a tortured, dying man and his final breath. But it's also about a victory one, about resurrection and the new life it can bring to each of us. But you've got to believe. And that belief needs to translate into a relationship. I didn't finish Walter Neff's story, so I don't know how that, that prison exchange changed him. Same is true with that guy named Barabbas. Remember Barabbas? The condemned zealot whom Pilate had come and stand next to Jesus, letting the crowds choose which one of them would be set free and which one would go to Calvary? Now, Barabbas was a known murderer, remember? He, he killed for his cause, the liberation from the Romans. Jesus, on the other hand, was the Prince of Peace, the light of the world, living water. Yet the winds and the crowd turned against Jesus that day, and Barabbas suddenly heard the words that Walter Neff heard. You are a free man. You can go. How do you suppose it felt to be Barabbas? To know that the cross they'd made for him was going to be carried by an innocent man. Perhaps a mix of joy and grief and relief and guilt as well. Whatever it is, it should leave us each in a different place than where we were with a new understanding of God's love for us and with a special appreciation for the punishment that Jesus took for us. Indeed, what Jesus does is much like what the what the whipping boys did back in the English court in days gone by. You heard of whipping boys? The role of a whipping boy was to receive the punishment assigned to a young prince who had misbehaved. You see, back then, the rules of the monarchy made it so that only the king could administer physical punishment to his son. And since kings were often busy or away, uh, when their sons got in trouble, Nobody else could punish the prince, so somebody had to take the punishment, so they'd, uh, they'd send for the whipping boy. Never good news when the whipping boy was sent for. Not going to be a good day. And he had to take the beating with the prince standing to witness. Now, that might sound like a great deal for the prince, right? Huh! I mess up, and somebody else takes the beating. But it's important to note that whipping boys were usually best friends with the prince. There was a close emotional bond between them, a genuine affection. And the hope was, because of this, that the, the prince would feel bad because his friend was taking the licking for him and, and the prince would change his ways because of their relationship. Think twice before he told that lie or, or back talk to his teachers, knowing that it could lead to his pal being unjustly punished. When we sin, we reconnect with the very things that put Jesus on the cross. When we break God's rules, we consort with the dark stuff that sent Jesus to crucifixion. And if we love him, really love him, do we want to be engaged in things that cause him pain? Think about it the next time you face your great temptation. When the enemy is calling you to come hither. Think about the 39 lashes Jesus took to cover that sin you're thinking of committing. The nails driven through his hands and feet. The unimaginable agony he endured. All because of what we've done and what we still might do. To be sure, the sacrifice is for our salvation. The forgiveness of our sins. But let, let me ask you, as we mature in our walk with Christ... Shouldn't we have less things to confess and more victories to celebrate? Well, there is much to celebrate as Christmas approaches. There are carols to sing and gifts to exchange. There's a stable to visit, a baby waiting in a lonely manger. There's new life and new hope for God's people. 
But what brings us the most joy at Christmas, or at least should, is why that baby was sent. Why he came down from heaven to dwell with us on earth in the first place. To grow to be the man who would save us from our sins. What does the scripture say? There is now no condemnation. There is now no condemnation. There is now no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus the Lord. No condemnation. We are free. The joy of Christmas, you see, is in Christ. And in what? What he came to do. And all God's people said, Amen.